everybody, and welcome to the Paranormal Portal. I'm your host, Brent Thomas. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we've got an epic show ahead, but uh, just remember, if any of you have experiences you'd like to share, I'd love to hear from you. You can either email me at paranormalportalradio at gmail.com or head over to paranormalportal.net and uh, scroll down and find the button that says interview me. And that'll allow you to look at a calendar of possible times and dates and uh, find a date that works for you. Love to hear your stories, so definitely get in touch with me. Everybody and welcome to the Paranormal Portal Podcast. I'm your host, Brent Thomas, and I am here to guide you through these wonderful worlds of the strange and unusual. Tonight, I thought we'd do a fantastic journey into ghost stories because we're heading into the Halloween season, and I can't think of a topic much more fitting than that. Of course, it is the time that is largely considered in uh, many circles when the veil between this world and the next becomes thinnest. Of course, climaxing in some uh, observations on Halloween. Others would suggest it continues until the Yule season. But in any, re- in any event, we're going to dive into a few different ghost stories tonight. And I hope you guys are ready because it's about to get spooky up in here. All right, we're going in. Right. So recently on a recent podcast episode, I did a discussion about what is a ghost and uh, covered a lot of ideas in there, a lot of possibilities. And while nobody knows, what we do know is that, uh, well, those of us listening um, believe that ghosts are very much a reality in our world. And uh, I've had several experiences myself, so I, I know it'll come to, as no surprise to tell you that I'm definitely a believer in the phenomena. So um, we haven't done many of these lately. Uh, I haven't done uh, narrations for quite a while here on the podcast, but I thought we'd dive into this tonight and hopefully you guys enjoy the ride. Uh, We're going to do a series of three different stories that I've found for you guys and hopefully enjoy them again we're largely considered uh, conditioned, rather, to look at ghost stories as these incredibly Hollywood-type events. The truth of the matter is that that actually couldn't be further from the truth in most cases. Now, that doesn't mean these events aren't absolutely extraordinary and showing us something absolutely incredible. And according to traditional scientific thinking and physics, Largely considered impossible, but they do happen. Uh, Again, I've experienced several things that are absolutely unexplainable in my own life. And I've spoken to so many others who've been through much the same. So this isn't ever trying to make you a believer. Whether you believe or not is up to you. Maybe you just like to kick back and listen to spooky stories that's fantastic. I'm thrilled to have you here. Maybe you're a true believer trying to understand the phenomena. I'm happy to have you here as well and everybody in between. So whatever the case is, whatever your personal purview of the paranormal is, I'm thrilled you're here and I'm excited to dive into this. So let's get after it. Okay, the first story we're going to be covering tonight is one that I called The Kids in the Darkness. And uh, it's a fascinating story that comes from a reservation area where there's houses and something was observed that seems absolutely phenomenal. No pun intended, by the way. So let's dive into this and see what you guys think. Here we go. The house we lived in is nine years old. And we're the only owners of this house since it was built and the only family that's ever lived in it. 
Where our house is located, there are about 15 other houses in our area, in a cluster, so to speak. Of all these houses were built and occupied in the same year. Our neighborhood was just outside of town, and the houses are situated on a horseshoe-shaped road where there's only one entrance and exit, and the other end is a dead end. The closest neighbor to our community of houses is a half mile away towards town. Behind our homes on both sides are miles of livestock pasture. In our cluster of homes is a dog pound that has at least a few dogs being cared for there at all times. Beside the dog pound's fenced enclosure just outside the fence perimeter, on one side is a medium-sized mound of dirt. This pile of dirt has been there for quite some time, as there are grasses and weeds growing on it. There's a street light uh, inside the fence used to illuminate the fenced-in property. Now, my husband and I are both smokers, but we don't smoke inside of our home. We usually go in front of the house and open the garage door and stand in the garage or driveway and have our smokes. On my husband's days off, we're actually night owls and we stay up really late watching television or just visiting. With the dog's pound so close to our home, we would often hear the dogs whining and barking and raising a ruckus all hours of the night, which had a chain reaction with the neighborhood dogs. This was a pretty regular occurrence. Well, one summer night, we were outside just having a cigarette at about 1 a.m., and we heard the dogs making a racket at the pound, so I looked up to see if perhaps the neighboring horses had just gotten too close to the fence, and that was what was causing the dogs to go bananas. But I couldn't believe what I saw. On that pile of dirt, I could see smaller children playing on that pile of dirt. I pointed this out to my husband and asked if he could see them. Well, unfortunately, he couldn't, but I clearly saw them there. I was shocked, and I decided to go waken my teenage daughter and asked her to come out to look. My daughter was able to see them as well. Well, together, we were able to count six kids that were playing on that pile of dirt. We weren't able to make out any details, but they were clearly about the size of six-year-olds playing on that pile of dirt in the early morning darkness. There wasn't any sound or laughing that you might expect. The only sound was that of the dogs carrying on. I am Native American, and where we live is on a reservation. Growing up, I was taught that if a dog was barking and whining and making an almost language kind of sound, it means there's a ghost nearby. And these dogs were absolutely making these strange sounds. My daughter and I continued to watch these child ghosts running and jumping on the pile of dirt, but their silence was truly bizarre. We continued to see these children playing on the dirt pile from time to time, but it only occurs late at night. That's a, that's a wild story. Now, there is no doubt that there are some people that can see spiritual entities or ghosts or, or whatever have you, and there are other people that just can't. And I'm not saying that some people are gifted or not gifted. I just think that there's some of us, I, I think this is an ability that everybody has somewhere ingrained in us. But there are some people that for some reason, perhaps some genetic trait, some, some twist of fate, maybe some occurrences in their past, they're just so much more tuned into this stuff. And so it doesn't surprise me that the husband just couldn't see it. It's not like his eyesight was bad. He just could not see these children playing on this pile of dirt. 
but she and her daughter both both were. Now, it's also possible that the husband doesn't share the native blood that uh, the wife does, and I don't know. There was no information on that in the root story, but it, it's certainly a possibility because there are there are certainly traits such as that switched on awareness that may very well follow bloodlines. It's why, you know, families will have a chain of psychic people and so on and so forth. So that part is, is, is very interesting, but it, it doesn't, it's not a merit of value or standing. It's just a curiosity that for some people it's just on, they can see these things they can experience them. They can, you know, participate in these events fully aware of what's going on around them. I'm not one of those people that can see these things. I have seen an apparition before, but it was a fleeting glimpse and then it was gone. So I, and I've certainly been exposed to a lot of, uh, you know, ghostly activity. I just don't see them doing it. So, uh, I, you know, I'm, I guess I'm kind of jealous of that to be honest, <laughs> But maybe, maybe then again, folks, maybe in this case, ignorance is bliss. Because if you could, I, I've often said, if you could suddenly, if everybody could just suddenly be 100% aware of spiritual activity around them and be able to see it clearly, we would probably all need to stop and scrape our underwear. I just think we're, we're swimming in a world of spirit, so to speak. So um, not, not to suggest that these spirits are even completely aware of us, but it's something to think about. Um, of course, the other thing this story really points out, and this is why I love all stories, and they don't have to be these huge Hollywood events. They don't have to be these, you know, poltergeist in real life, the movies poltergeist happening in real life, that even some of the subtle strangeness can really teach us a lot. Like in this one, it's definitely a, a reaffirmation of the fact that, look, animals are cued into this stuff and are fantastically good at giving indication that something's not right. And that can mean a lot of things, but it certainly is true in spiritual hauntings, ghostly hauntings and such, that animals seem to cue in on this stuff very quickly. So having an animal, I think, is probably a good thing if you're concerned about any of that stuff because they they will pick on up on it probably long before we will in most cases so that's that's a powerful reminder now this actual instance there's no suggesting for sure what kind of event it is but i suspect that this may be what's known as a residual haunt and again um, throughout the course of the show, I've mentioned this several times, but there's two major categories that, that hauntings break into. And one is residual, the other is intelligent. And residual haunts are basically like a recorded event that just will periodically replay. Now, there isn't enough detail here to know if the activities seem to be duplicated, like the same kid slides down the same way, or jumps in the same way every time, or if the activity seems unique and fresh each time it's observed. But there's a good chance that there's no indication that these presences are very attuned to the fact that they're being observed. They don't seem to acknowledge the people or what's going on around them. They're just doing their thing. So is it is it just a residual haunting, which is not much more than just a watching a movie at home. You can replay the movie. The movie does the same thing. None of the characters on the screen are aware that you're there watching them. So it's just a recording of sorts that just spits out every once in a while for any number of reasons. But it is an interesting uh, event. Now, an intelligence haunting, just for any of you that might be new, would be these are these are hauntings or spiritual activity that seems very much aware and responding to the people around whether it's, if it's an apparition, it's looking at you, it's watching you. Um, if it's activity, it's throwing stuff maybe at you. And that's a, that's a pretty charged example. Most hauntings aren't quite like that, but like you grab a door or you're going to grab a door and suddenly it slams. Well, that's very intelligent. Like it, it knew you're reaching for that door and it's trying to freak you out. So that's, that's the difference. It's, the intelligent haunts are very much 
either targeting or, or, or dealing with a specific person or just aware of whatever was one is doing in the house or, or location and responding to them in uh, maybe unique ways. So I don't know for those stories, which is which, but I find that incredibly interesting. So now we're going to dive into the second story that I've gotten. I call this one, the funeral home. And this is, this is kind of a creepy story. Um, there are certainly, this is something I was going to talk about at the tail end of, of the, of the story, but this is one of those locations. A funeral home is certainly one of those locations that seems probably pretty likely to have at least some strangeness going on whether it's a lingering strangeness or if it's just for a short period of time due to the nature of what's going on in funeral homes, you can kind of understand why that there may be some unsettled energies that are like, wait, what? I'm dead. What? And freaking out and maybe raising a ruckus for a period of time. It doesn't mean that they linger for extended periods of time, but there's a belief that many of our deceased loved ones when they pass are present at their own funerals for whatever reason. And I guess I could see that as probably being something that you'd want to be there with your family, uh, you know, while they go through that, even, you know, I don't know. It's just a, it's just a theory, but it could very well be true. So this one is called the funeral home. Well, that's what I called it. So that's what you're going to hear. <laughs> my story starts out when my boyfriend's parents bought a funeral home out of state. His parents wanted him to take care of the funeral home as they didn't want to move out of the state themselves. So my boyfriend and I packed up and moved out of state to take care of the funeral home for his parents. Well, you got to love your family for that. <laughs> if my mom called me and said, Hey, I want you to run this funeral home. I'd be like, no, I think I'm busy, but God bless him. The funeral home is everything you would expect. It was a huge, spacious property that definitely felt creepy. But both the lawn and the building itself were quite beautiful. The interior was very well maintained, but the funeral home had many doors, which all eventually would lead back to the main viewing room. Well, it didn't take long for things to start getting a bit weird, as you might expect. It all began when my boyfriend would catch a glimpse of dark figures, mostly on one specific side of the funeral home, which was near a side door that leads to the apartment on the second level of the funeral home. Well, nobody lives there, of course, so this act activity was certainly a surprise. I, on the other hand, have never seen anything the whole time that I've been there. Well, one evening I stopped in alone to use the fax machine and just do some job hunting online. Upon arrive into the location, I went to the back door to go in, but I found that door was already unlocked and ajar. Well, I thought this was unusual, but I went inside and I turned on the lights and made my way to the office. I spent some time faxing resumes and searching the web for jobs when suddenly the computer just shuts off. Well, at this point, I decided it was just time to leave. I didn't feel anything really, and I certainly wasn't afraid until I got close to the back door. I had an overwhelming feeling to run. It started to feel really cold in the back hallway, and I instantly got goosebumps all over. Well, I sprinted to the back door and made sure to lock it as I left. And I've never gone back there alone at night again since. 
my boyfriend's uncle would sometimes come and help us with the property, and one day he showed up to cut the grass. Well, as he was there, he went to the backside of the property and found that same door open that I had discovered the night I went alone. He thought we must have been there, so he walked in the back hallway inside at the same spot where that overwhelming fear and cold swept over me. He called my boyfriend's name, to which there was no answer. He realized all the lights were off and the entire home was dark. He was overcome with fear once he realized that nobody was there and hurriedly left the property and, to this day, will not enter the funeral home alone. If, if he has to come and remove snow or cut grass, he brings his own shovels and mower to finish and leave as quickly as possible. After a funeral had been done, my boyfriend and I go to the property just to make sure everything is locked up and shut down for the day. Many times, when we come to get the mail, the side door or the back door will be unlocked. And we would check the entire building to make sure that nobody had broken in, but we never found anyone inside. One time, my boyfriend opened up the funeral home for a family to bring items for an upcoming funeral that was to be conducted there. Well, after they were finished, he locked the entire building. He then went past a side door as he was leaving the property and found it unlocked and open. Well, he said, hello? And from the darkness inside, he heard a male voice answer him saying, hello. He became incredibly freaked out and wouldn't go back inside. When I later finished working, he made me go with him to check out the building, but again, there was nobody there. It didn't matter how many times we would lock the back door because on our next visit, it would be unlocked. A couple of days after he encountered the voice saying, hello, my boyfriend said that while we were asleep in our bed, he witnessed a tall, dark figure walk around our bed that eventually made its way to his side of the bed and proceeded to lay down on top of him. He tried screaming for me to wake me up, but I was unable to hear him. He eventually broke free and did wake me up. He was so frightened that we slept with the bedroom door closed and we both prayed before sleeping and we put crosses up all over our home. Three weeks later, I was home alone as my boyfriend was out of state with his family. I went to sleep one night and I rolled over to his side of the bed and I could swear that I felt something that, and, I, and I couldn't see. And it was on top of me. It was incredibly strange as I felt that I was standing up and asleep at the same time. And I remember hearing myself pray and sing a Christian song in my head. When I finally had completely woken up, I was singing the Christian song out loud, and only two minutes had passed. I honestly wasn't afraid. I just chalked it up to a really weird dream at the time and just went back to sleep. It was later that my boyfriend told me that his mom had brought him to a shaman who helped to release a female spirit that was attached to him from the funeral home. This was happening at the time I experienced this dream. Following the shaman clearing the attachment, we haven't experienced more activity in our home or at the funeral home. We had installed alarms in the funeral home due to the doors refusing to stay locked 
and just to protect the property. But I was so relieved when his parents finally decided to sell the property. Yikes. Yeah, that's, that's all kinds of creepy for sure. Now, again, nothing was really being aggressive or over the top. There was just some presence there. Now, does it make sense that funeral homes might have some lingering presence? Absolutely. Uh, I, again, there's any number of reasons why a spirit might remain earthbound. And maybe it's not even permanently, but maybe it's for a period of time. And maybe that's an adjustment time. There's a lot of different cultures around the world that hold the idea that for several days or a period of time following somebody's passing, certain things need to be observed because of these people wandering around. And one of which is in uh, Slavic countries, they will cover the mirrors for a period of three days, I think, is, is the number. And I might be mistaken. But the idea is that they don't want the spirit to inadvertently get trapped in a mirror. That something about mirrors is, is important. And so covering them protects the spirit to help it find its way home, I guess, or to the next world or whatever have you. So it doesn't surprise me that you know funeral homes may have presences from time to time and potentially presences all the time. It's hard to know, but certainly... A funeral is a very, a very tragic event. It's saying goodbye to somebody precious and dear, a loved one, or at least someone you care about. And with all of that sadness and, and such, it may very well be almost a superstorm in some senses if there are entities that seek out negative energy. And that, that pain, that sadness may draw something really dark and negative. Those, uh, I can't tell you how many stories through the years that I've covered, read, heard firsthand from witnesses dealing with funeral homes. So <laughs> they, they might be uh, uh, affordable real estate in some cases, but yeah, you get what you pay for, I guess is the big takeaway there. I don't know. But there are certain locations that definitely seem more prone to activity and hauntings. Of course, jails, prisons, uh, hospitals, uh, you know, in places for infirmed asylums, etc., where there is a plethora of, of charged emotions going on. And those seem to be magnets for things. If there's wandering earthbound spirits, then maybe that's where they go. And, and I, we could get into that whole concepts and ideology around that perhaps some other time. But suffice it to say that in places where there's extremes of emotional energy, those seem to be really likely places to have paranormal activity. And you can take of that what you will. Maybe it's any number of things, but at any rate, there's no question that that does seem to be a constant. So it is what it is. <laughs> Now, certainly in, in these places, such as funeral homes, such as cemeteries, such as, you know, haunted locations, there's always the risk for those that go into them. Um, one of the biggest takeaways, I think, is in, and maybe one of the biggest liabilities of our current age of paranormal investigating, it's become the, the newest reality show that everybody wants to try. And I don't begrudge people that. I think go out and do it. But I do think it's important to be wary of the fact that something might be stuck there. And then you come along and you might be a lot more of an attractive option for them to cling to than to look at some dilapidated building that's slowly falling out, uh, apart over time. And it may decide to linger and follow you. And that's what's basically known as an attachment. So there has to be practices in place and I'm not going to prescribe any specific practices or rituals that people should observe. Just use whatever resonates with you spiritually, but start with prayers, you know, and, uh, and when you get done end with prayers or start with some form of cleansing ritual or smudging or something of that accord uh, prayers, um, you know, religious verse, whatever, 
and end with that, you know, uh, that it's important to be protected. And, and that can mean whatever it means to you. I'm not suggesting you have to be a religious person, but I'm just suggesting that it is important to at least make statements like when you're done, hey, you are not allowed to follow me home. You're not allowed to leave here with me. You must remain. This is, I am not where you should be going. You are not welcome to follow me. And those statements can be incredibly powerful as well, just alone. But coupled with, you know, religious observation that you're passionate about, spiritual practice that you're passionate about, whatever, that becomes even more powerful. So be careful for attachments. These, these spirits can, most likely they're very benign, but there can be some nightmare scenarios that, that take off following uh, somebody poking into the paranormal. So just be careful, please. If you suspect you do have potentially attachments or something following you, I would suggest you find some measure, and that could be, could be spiritual, could be any number of different practices to get rid of attachments. Like in this story, the shaman was able to see that something had attached to the boyfriend and was able to break that attachment. And sure enough, the activity died down then. That's fantastic. But, you know, definitely don't, I don't think it's good to become complacent with something clinging onto your life um, for whatever reason. First of all, you don't really know what they're after, what they want. Is it truly dark and nefarious? Well, maybe not, but it's still, it's not where these things belong. They don't really, I don't, I don't mean to dehumanize them in case they are or formerly were people, but at the same point, they need to go home. They need to go on with the next phase of whatever this is. And following us around, I don't think, is probably healthy for either the, the spirit or ghost or for the people. So that's my take on that. All right, now we're going to get into the third and final story. This one I thought was kind of kind of creepy but kind of maybe heartwarming or maybe really creepy. Depends on how you take the last part of the story. And we'll discuss that at the end. And this one I called A Message from the Dead. And here we go. Many years ago, a boy that was in my school had gone down a very dark personal path and ended up taking his own life. It was a very sad event for all of us. He had been a classmate for about seven years and then suddenly switched schools. And soon after, we all heard the news. I'll call him Billy to protect his identity. A week after he had taken his own life, my friend Eliza and I decided to have a sleepover at her house. She had known Billy and asked if I would go to, with her to the funeral that day prior to our sleepover. Well, I had recently attended another classmate's funeral that same year and just didn't have it in me to attend another, so I declined. I never liked funerals, not that anyone does. And when I told Eliza no, she chose to not attend the funeral as well. Well, that day, we're in her house just having some girl talk about anything and everything. Well, Eliza suddenly got a serious look on her face and told me, You know, my house is haunted. Well, this news really sent a chill down my spine, knowing I agreed to spend the night with her in her haunted house. And then again, I also thought she could just be trying to freak me out. So I said, oh yeah, we'll prove it. 
Eliza told me that she and her family were in the living room on the couches one night watching a movie when suddenly all the doors in the house slammed simultaneously. And all the pictures and decorations on the walls instantly fell to the floor. Well, I responded with, well, that's only one thing that happened. We'll see. Maybe it'll come out just for you, said Eliza, hauntingly. Well, that sent another chill immediately down my spine. So I decided to change the subject just to keep from thinking about it. A bit later... We chose to go watch a movie in the living room, but as I got up to walk, I stepped on a nail which was laying on the floor. It didn't break the skin, but it did hurt, and I picked it up and laid it on the windowsill of her room. Eliza apologized for the nail being on the floor, which seemed to be a remnant of her recently hanging up some pictures. So after... We're all in, we're in the living room watching a scary movie and it's still daylight out. And as I was watching the movie, I caught a bit of movement out of the corner of my eye. I turned to see what it was and found that the old wooden rocking chair in the living room had started rocking on its own. Well, this made me pretty uncomfortable, so... I waited until it stopped rocking and decided to try to recreate the event. I tried stomping around the room to see if that could have caused the chair to begin rocking. And I tried several times just plopping down on the couch to see if that could have caused it. But nothing made the chair move. The only way I was able to get the chair to rock was to physically sit in the chair and rock it. Well, Eliza was preoccupied with texting on her phone and watching the movie, but did finally notice me trying to recreate the rocking rocking chair. She asked me, what are you doing? I explained to her what I had seen and told her I tried everything I could think of to see if it was the result of something that we had done, but nothing explained the chair rocking on its own. Eliza became very scared and dragged me back to her room as she was just too frightened to remain in the living room at all. I honestly wasn't scared by all this and I just brushed it off and went with her. When we returned to her room, I walked over to the window just to look outside to clear my mind. I just needed a moment to breathe. Well, at the window... I rested my arms on the windowsill as I looked outside. and I felt a small pinch on my elbow and realized I just rested my arm on the nail that I had placed there not long before as we left the room to go watch a movie. Suddenly, I jumped in surprise and shock. Not from the nail that I just re-encountered, but... There was a fresh words that were scratched into the windowsill, as if from the nail itself that read, Rip Billy. I spun to Eliza and asked, Did you touch this nail? I already knew the answer, as Eliza was with me the entire time, and I know she hadn't. She said, No? She saw the words as well and said, You know what this means. I knew it meant that our house is indeed haunted. And it seemed that the message was almost compassionate. That's a pretty fascinating story um, or encounter or experience. I don't mean to trivialize any of these as just stories, but you understand what I mean. But... It does seem that spirits have an awareness of things that go beyond the way that we gather information. It's surprising 
how much they seem to understand. And there's any number of reasons why that could be. Maybe, A, they're just tuned into the energy around them and can feel when things like that happen. Like they are energetic beings. And so when tragedies happen, they may become absolutely aware of it. Information doesn't necessarily need words or explaining. Maybe in the, in the energetic realm, information is just readily available. The other thought is maybe it's more of a, a telepathic thing where they can just know everything that's going on with you just by being near you. We're kind of conditioned to think that our thoughts and ideas are just contained within this, this, this skull of ours, the head that we live with, and, and that's where our thoughts exist. But I think it's probably more accurate to suggest that our, our thoughts continue into the universe around us. And we are like radio stations broadcasting at all times. And in, in, our, in our physical incarnations, we're probably not real aware of those things on most levels until uh, for some people, those, you know, the information may break through. And that's where you get telepathic or psychic events. But maybe they can just read us like a book. They know what we're thinking. I don't know. It's anybody's guess, really, but it is interesting. So the other take that I had about this encounter was the message itself, the Rip Billy, rest in peace. And it it does seem like maybe the, the, the experiencer is right that it was a compassionate thing. But what if it was more mocking? What if it was a much darker take? than that and i don't pretend to know but i think it's worth considering that it could be either um nobody can know except for the people that were there you, you just kind of got to go with the vibe you got at the time uh unless you're one of those people that just react in shock and and you get over adrenalized then maybe you're not going to be real objective about the experience but you know if you if you feel like i've always believed when you're around something truly dark, you're going to feel like you're around something truly dark. And it goes beyond just the, oh, I can't explain this, I'm afraid thing. Like you're going to feel it. You're going to feel like you're swimming in it. It's, it's something truly horrible. So I don't know. I'm, I obviously was not at this location. I don't know what the vibe of this place was. It does sound like all those doors slamming at once and all that stuff falling down was a pretty aggressive thing, but it wasn't continual. And who knows what had actually triggered that. It could have been any number of things. And maybe it was not so horrible, but it was just something was pissed. And for some reason, and maybe it was a valid reason, we don't know. There's a lot of narrative we don't get and we can't possibly judge or create any kind of opinion on, but it is interesting. Um... But again, I don't think it's an aggressive thing. I don't think that all of this was an aggressive take or an aggressive haunt. Just a pretty bizarre event. But it is interesting on a lot of lot of levels. So again, you know, I've said it many times. I said it at the intro to the show, but we we don't need to have Hollywood level events to just dig into what's going on, what could be happening. And this is exactly why I'm doing these shows is because I just want to understand. I want to understand what does this mean? What can this teach us? What is this showing us about the, the reality we live in? What is it revealing? What does it teach? All of that. So this is my passion for this paranormal strangeness that we cover all the time on these shows. So I don't know. It's, it's again, there's never going to be any easy answers for any of it. Perhaps there never will be any answers, but I just love the journey. And I love that you guys are taking the journey with me. So uh, that's going to about wrap it up for tonight. Thank you so much for hanging with me. And thank you for your patience as this podcast will release one day later than it should, but it's just the way things work out sometimes. Sometimes life happens, and uh, all we can do is 
just try to do our best. And so that was what I'm doing now. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. I hope you had a good time. Thank you again for all the love and support. Thanks for everybody that continues to recommend the show to other people. That really means the world to me. So until next time, take care. everybody that's gonna wrap it up for us today so hope you guys enjoyed the show and thank you again so much for all your love and support and uh remember if you want to follow the paranormal portal probably the easiest way is to head over to paranormalportal.net and that's the homepage for the paranormal portal and you'll find links to all of our different social media and uh sites and information about the shows including our youtube channel which is youtube.com slash paranormal portal or just look for Paranormal Portal on, on Google or whatever search engine and you'll find links to our social media such as Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and uh, Twitter. So we're kind of all over the place and uh, we're spreading as, as well as we can. But anyway, thank you so much for the love and support. Y'all take care and remember, we love y'all. Be good, be kind, be nice. Take care of each other, help each other out. Find the magic in every day and remember to laugh as much as you can. Until next time.